Welcome to the deep dive. You guys were really curious about this whole debate surrounding a funeral elegy and who actually wrote it. So we're taking a deep dive into a YouTube video that really goes down the rabbit hole on this one. We're talking secret identities, possible death hoaxes, all the good stuff that makes a literary mystery juicy. Well now, let's not get carried away just yet. It's easy to get swept up in the thrill of a good mystery, but you know us. It's crucial to keep those critical thinking caps screwed on tight as we explore these theories. Absolutely. You know we're all about that here. So to set the stage, this YouTube video focuses on a funeral elegy, a poem published back in 1612. For ages, everyone in their book club just assumed it was written by this kind of obscure poet, William Peter. But then in the 1990s, scholar Donald Wayne Foster kind of throws a wrench in the whole thing. He publishes this analysis where he claims that the writing style, the word choices, sentence structure, that sort of thing, points to none other than William Shakespeare as the true author. And you can't easily dismiss Foster's analysis. He's well respected for his work on Shakespearean linguistics, you know. He did this really meticulous comparison of a funeral elegy with Shakespeare's known works and found some pretty compelling similarities in their use of language. Okay, so mystery solved. Can we all go home now? Not so fast. This is where it gets even more interesting. The video then brings in Yield de Montserrat, another scholar who presents a counter-argument. He'd been doing his own digging and uncovered these strong contextual links between a funeral elegy and the works of another big-name playwright from the same era, John Ford. Oh, okay, so now we've got a real head-scratcher. Two potential suspects, both with seemingly credible claims. Who do we believe? And here's where the video takes an even wilder turn. It suggests that maybe, just maybe, both Foster and Ron Surratt were onto something. Wait, wait, back up a sec. How can both of them be right? Yeah, it's a real brain teaser. The video proposes this theory that William Shakespeare, or W.S., as he's sometimes used, and John Ford, J.F., were actually pseudonyms used by the same person, but for different genres or styles of writing. Whoa, okay, now that's a conspiracy theory I can get behind. So spill the tea. Who is this mysterious figure supposedly hiding behind these pen names? Drum roll, please. The video points to Christopher Marlowe as the potential true author of A Funeral Elegy. Hold on, Marlowe. As in, the playwright who supposedly died before this poem was even a thought bubble. Exactly. History books tell us that Marlowe died in 1593, stabbed above the eye in some tavern brawl. But get this, there's a whole group of scholars who believe that his death was staged and that he actually continued writing under all these different aliases. Oh, this is good and good. So they're saying Marlowe might have been Shakespeare and John Ford? That's what the video is suggesting, yeah. Okay, I'm hooked. But what kind of evidence is there to support this whole Marlowe theory? What makes them think he could be the mastermind behind a funeral elegy? Well, those who favor this theory point to a few interesting clues. For starters, there's the dedication of the poem itself. It's addressed to the virtuous and worthy gentleman, Matthew Royden. And then there's this line in there about our ever-living poet. Some scholars believe that this ever-living poet bit is a subtle nod to Marlowe. Like he's still alive, just living and writing under a different name. Sneaky. I love it. A secret message hidden in plain sight. Okay, what other clues are they seeing? Well, there are also some pretty intriguing parallels between the subject matter of a funeral elegy and Marlowe's own life. The poem mourns the death of this young man, William Peter, who met in an untimely end because of a head wound, right? Yeah, sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? Right, almost like Marlowe was writing his own elegy, but using this pen name, this William Peter, to kind of mask his true identity. Whoa. That's some deep stuff. So it's like he's saying, hey, I'm still here, but I can't exactly say that out loud. So here's this poem instead. That's one way to interpret it. Yeah. And it doesn't end there. The video goes on to highlight even more specific details within the poem that seem to echo events or themes from Marlowe's life. OK, now you've got my full attention. What kind of details are we talking about here? Well, the video focuses on these lines, lines 482 to 502, where the speaker talks about the sudden and unexpected nature of death how it can, and I'm quoting here, betray our geology to Ruth. <sighs> this whole theme of betrayal, the suddenness of death, it really resonates with what we know about how Marlowe supposedly died. That whole tavern brawl thing, if it even happened, definitely suggests an element of treachery and violence, right? Yeah, I see what you mean. It definitely makes you wonder if there's more to the story. What else does that passage tell us? Well, it goes on and describes this William Peter character as someone who lived a very full and virtuous life. Someone who... And again, I'm quoting here, dies but once, but doubly lives. 
This concept of duality, of living a double life, some scholars argue that this could be a subtle hint towards Marlowe's own situation, first as Christopher Marlowe, and then as this entirely different person. It's like he's wrestling with the loss of his old life and trying to navigate this new secret existence, and he's pouring all of those complex emotions into his writing. Exactly. It's a really fascinating interpretation, isn't it? But uh, if Marlowe really did fake his own death, wouldn't somebody have recognized him, like spilled the beans? That's a question that a lot of people have, yeah. And the video does address that. Supporters of the Marlowe theory, they argue that he was really good at disguises, not just like, you know, fake mustaches and stuff, but disguising his whole persona too. They bring up his past as a spy for the English crown, which, if you think about it, means he'd have to be pretty good at disappearing and assuming new identities. Oh, totally. So are they saying he used those spy skills to basically go undercover and write under these pen names? Exactly. It's a pretty wild idea. And it gets even more intriguing when you consider that the historical record on what actually happened to Marlowe is kind of murky. Some accounts say he died right there in that tavern brawl. Others suggest he might have clung to life for a few days. Oh, wow. I didn't realize there was so much uncertainty around his death. Right. And that lack of a clear-cut account... It just fuels all these conspiracy theories. Talk about a recipe for intrigue. Speaking of intrigue, the video mentions something about coded messages hidden within a funeral elegy. What's that all about? And this is where it gets really interesting. Some scholars believe that Marlowe actually embedded secret messages in the poem itself. Like, he used wordplay and symbolism to communicate with people who were in on his secret. Oh, come on. A secret code within a poem. You've got to give me the good stuff. What kind of messages are we talking about here? So one of the examples that pops up is the word shadow. It appears throughout the poem, right? And Marlowe enthusiasts, they see that as a deliberate choice. Like, he's using that word to evoke this idea of a hidden identity. A life lived in secret. Living in the shadows, literally. Okay, that's pretty clever. What other secret messages are they finding? There's this other passage that describes the deceased, this William Peter, as banished from earth of comforts all deprived. And some scholars, they see that as a reflection of how Marlowe himself might have felt if he was living under an assumed name. Isolated, exiled, cut off from his former life. So he's using the poem to process those feelings, those sacrifices he made to keep his true identity hidden. That's one interpretation. But, you know, we have to remember that this is all subjective, right? We can't actually prove that Marlowe intended for these meanings to be there. It's up to each reader to look at the evidence and come to their own conclusions. Right, right. Like, maybe some of this is just us reading too much into things. But still, it's fun to entertain the possibilities, you know. But, okay, we've been talking a lot about Marlowe. Are there any other potential authors or explanations for a funeral elegy that we haven't touched on yet? Like, any other contenders for the author's chair? Right. It's important to remember that the Marlowe theory is just one theory. Some scholars maintain that William Peter, the obscure poet listed as the author, was in fact the actual author. Their argument is that, hey, just because he's not a household name doesn't mean he wasn't capable of writing a beautiful and moving elegy. Yeah, it's a good reminder that not all great artists get their 15 minutes of fame, right? Exactly. And then there's another theory that suggests a funeral elegy might have been a collaborative work, potentially written by a group of poets, which wasn't uncommon in Elizabethan and Jacobean theater. Remember, playwrights often collaborated on scripts during that time. A team effort to create a literary masterpiece. Yeah. I kind of love that idea. Right. It's a fun one to consider. But ultimately, that's what's so fascinating about this whole thing. Every piece of evidence, every theory, it adds another layer to the mystery. Like we're piecing together a centuries-old puzzle trying to solve a literary cold case. And in this case, there might not even be a definitive answer. Exactly. It's about weighing the evidence, exploring the different possibilities, and ultimately deciding for yourself what you believe. So we've got all these theories floating around, but is there anything in the poem itself, besides the dedication and those lines about betrayal and double lives, anything else that could point us towards the real author? Well, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? And believe me, it's a question that sparked more than a few heated debates in academic circles. Some scholars zero in on the overall style and tone of the poem as potential clues. They argue that a funeral elegy, while a beautifully written piece, it doesn't quite have that signature wit and wordplay that we often associate with Shakespeare. Oh, interesting. You're saying it's not his typical style. Yeah, exactly. They find it to be more somber, more introspective, closer in style, actually, to some of John Ford's other work. So we're back to square one then. It's like the poem itself is a puzzle within a puzzle. 
Is there any kind of consensus among scholars about which way the evidence leans? Or are we all just along for the ride at this point? You know, that's the thing about this whole debate. There's no easy answer. The authorship of a funeral elegy remains this big, fascinating question mark. Some scholars find those linguistic similarities with Shakespeare convincing. Others, they're more persuaded by the connections to John Ford and his body of work. And then there are those who just can't resist the allure of the Marlowe theory with all its mystery and intrigue. It's like we're trying to crack a centuries-old code. But even with all the clues and theories, we might never know for sure. So where does that leave us? How should we approach a funeral elegy with this cloud of uncertainty hanging over it? Well, I think that's part of what makes this whole thing so captivating, don't you think? The mystery itself just adds to the poem's allure. It encourages us to read it with this heightened sense of curiosity, to really dig in and look for those hidden depths and meanings. Ultimately, I think it reminds us that literature, it's more than just words on a page. It's a living, breathing thing that continues to evolve and reveal new layers of meaning over time. It's like the poem itself has become a kind of Rorschach test, right? Right. We see in it what we want to see, what resonates with our own interpretations and biases. Yeah, exactly. It's all about perspective. So what's your take after diving deep into all of this? What do you find to be the most compelling argument? And what should our listeners take away from all of this? Honestly, for me, it's less about pinning down a definitive answer and more about appreciating the journey. This whole debate surrounding a funeral elegy really highlights just how subjective literary interpretation can be. There are often multiple ways to read and understand a text, and no single interpretation has a monopoly on truth. So it's not really about finding the right answer, but rather engaging with the different possibilities. Precisely. And if there's one thing I hope our listeners take away from this deep dive, it's that. Don't be afraid to question assumptions, to explore the mysteries that literature throws our way. Even if we never know for sure who actually wrote a funeral elegy, just grappling with these questions can enrich our understanding and appreciation for the work itself. Absolutely. Sometimes the most rewarding journeys are the ones that don't lead to a final destination, but to a deeper understanding of the questions we're asking along the way. So to all our listeners out there, we want to hear from you. Are you Team Shakespeare, Team Ford, or are you jumping on the Team Marlowe bandwagon? Let us know your thoughts after this deep dive into a funeral elegy. And until next time, keep those pages turning and those minds churning.